The Digital Distributed Online Chaos will now present you no POC, no fix, a sad story about Bluetooth security. So uh, POC here stands for proof of concept and not people of color. It's about technology. Uh, it's uh, just a broken mem, mem copy in the Bluetooth stack, and do we really need to fix that? So that's probably what uh, the Bluetooth developer thought, and Jan Ruge is talking about what he found about uh, what he found out about it. So to Jan. Hi, uh, my name is Jan Ruge, and uh, as Lindworm said before, my talk is no pop, no fix. And I want to present some additional uh, IT security findings that we had in the Bluetooth stack. And I want to uh, tell you something about the vulnerabilities as well as our methodology, and also something about the disclosure process that we had with those windows. So first of all, my motivation why I want to do this. Um, during my time at university, there was a next one firmware patching project, as Jeska mentioned before, and it was targeting uh, Broadcom Wi-Fi controllers. So the main idea was that we can implement the monitor mode on the Nexus 5, what wasn't possible before. So they built this whole patching framework um, around it so that we have access to the firmware and can modify it. And as a consequence, uh, others use this knowledge um, to build exploits against uh, those Wi-Fi controllers. Most prominent is a Broadpone exploit by Google Project Zero. And other one was uh, by Quark's lab in April April uh, 2019. So this is always uh, something you have to keep in mind if you do uh, reverse engineering and make your knowledge public. Um, others might you uh, will use it to to write exploits, and those are of course only the the public uh, known exploits. There might be even others um, that we don't know about. So currently uh, at CMO there is a lot of research going on regarding uh, Broadcom Bluetooth controllers, as you heard before. Um, there's the internal group project that uh, adds debugging capabilities to the um, to, to those uh, Bluetooth controllers. And we are currently having there the same problem that we have uh, making a lot of knowledge um, about the controllers publicly available. Um, and so we wanted to have a look um, before others do um, if there are some um, obvious vulnerabilities. So first of all, a little bit of background. So um, most of you already heard of Bluetooth. It's a radio protocol, it operates at 2.4 gigahertz, and it's uh, usually used for communication between two devices or more devices. So for example, your mobile phone uh, communicating with the headset. And what some people uh, might not know is that when you have a, a mobile device with Bluetooth just enabled, um, you can connect to it per default. So for example, you can, uh, can run L2 ping, what will open up an uh, L2 cup connection and run ping, ping commands over it. And this is of course a huge attack surface if you can interact with nearby devices uh, without them even noticing. Um, so yeah, and in addition, there are some protocols that are hidden or terminated in the firmware, so they are not accessible from the host. And those are quite poorly documented and the implementation is not public, so um, those are also prone to errors. And the plat platform that we use, I guess this guy already showed it to you, um, is this uh, Cypress Development Board. Um, if you say Cypress or Broadcom, um, I use the terms basically as the same vendor because uh, Cypress has acquired a Broadcom wireless um, stuff a couple of years ago, so um, the copyright in the firmware is also Broadcom. And yeah, as I said, we used those um, Bluetooth Low Energy um, development boards um, because you can run C code on them, so uh, you have this wise uh, development environment and can execute the, your C code on the controller. And most interesting here is that there is no separation between the application that runs on the um, on the controller and the uh, firmware. So you can read all memory regions, you can um, read the RAM, you can read the ROM and even interact with it. Uh, in addition, uh, the firmware somehow has to link the C code uh, against the code that is stored in the ROM so that you can use primitives from, uh, from the already existing fir firmware. And so the uh, development environment basically leaks 
function names, uh, global variables, and hardware register names for everything, and what made our reverse engineering progress uh, a lot, lot faster. So now uh, a little bit about the Bluetooth protocols that are relevant here. So on the right, we have a diagram. Um, on the top, there is the host, and the bottom here, this big thing is the, uh, is the firmware. And uh, here you can see there's the l 2 cup protocol I mentioned before. It's uh, basically the lowest layer that can be uh, used to communicate uh, between two devices. And this uh, l 2 cup protocol is then uh, wrapped into HCI, whereas HCI is a communication protocol used to, uh, for the host to speak to the firmware. And uh, for the firmware itself, uh, you have here on top the um, hardware registers for the serial interface. And then uh, this blue stuff over here is uh, the multi-threaded firmware. So there runs a real-time operating system on the firmware, uh, impl implementing multiple threads. And here on the uh, top, there's a BD transport thread, what is responsible for parsing HCI messages. And yeah, this, uh, then we have here the link manager that uh, processes those uh, HCI me messages and also implements the link manager protocol. What is the protocol I mentioned before that is already terminated in the firmware and not accessible to uh, to the host. And this uh, link manager also controls something that is called a Bluetooth core scheduler. And this is a, an additional component uh, developed by Broadcom. So it's a custom scheduler. Um, and this scheduler is involved for each Bluetooth clock cycle, what is around about 300 microseconds. So this um, interrupt handler here on the bottom is invoked 3,000 uh, 3, times a second. And this uh, Bluetooth core scheduler uh, implements all the time critical tasks um, for the Bluetooth protocol. And now I'm a little bit more of background. So as I mentioned before, there's the internal Blue project. Um, uh, they uh, that you can use for debugging the, the firmware. And as the pr uh, project was developed first, uh, they were working on the Nexus 5, so they didn't have uh, any symbols, and they're just doing it by plain reverse en engineering. And even though they were able to get access to the link manager protocol and extract uh, those messages and also send arbitrary messages, and in this talk, I want to talk you, uh, talk about Frankenstein, which is an emulating and C patching framework. And this is also what uh, was used to review the Bluetooth core scheduler. And why is this important? Um, because if you have a, a look at a Bluetooth packet, this is how it looks on the physical layer. Um, in the beginning, you have the um, channel access code, what is basically a link ident uh, identifier between two devices. Then you have the packet header, um, that describes basically the type of the packet. Is this a management packet? Is this a data packet? And then there is a payload header, what describes some flow control stuff and uh, a length field. And in the end, you have finally the payload. So if you are, have no or don't know about the Bluetooth core scheduler, the, you only have access to the payload. For example, if you're coming from the host, you can set arbitrary L2 cup packets. And if you can send LMP packets, you can send um, management packets uh, with uh, arbitrary payload. But as we now have uh, also access to those um, packet and payload header, uh, we can basically send uh, arbitrary package, uh, packets. And in this talk, uh, most uh, the payload header will be most important because um, this um, triggered some interesting bugs. So um, main technique that we uh, used um, was uh, hooking. So as I said before, we can uh, execute C code on the controller. So we um, built a custom hooking algorithm, um, hooking me mechanism. So we can easily debug the firmware. For example, we can trace function calls, extract the um, the arguments um, that are used to call this function. And in addition, we used it to implement some attacks because we needed to modify the um, protocol behavior on the link manager protocol level and also implement uh, used it for fuzzing. And yeah, what we um, did pretty early in the process was we found the function that uh, is responsible to copy the 
payload data to to the uh, send buffer to the hardware send buffer and so we send a, a basically set a hook on this function and at this point we can modify the packet and payload header and even the payload and therefore implement uh, fuzzing and this is how it uh, looks like in, in practice so this is actually the code here uh, we have this function here uh, bcs dmr tx enable e eir and what is basically the, the function that copies extended inquiry response packets to the to the send buffer and extended inquiry response packets are the response if you're doing a device inquiry so if you are scanning two devices and um, this is uh, the response packet it says run about 240 bytes of data so it was quite uh, interesting because there uh, fits a lot of data into it and this here on the bottom is the actual fuzzing function that is invoked prior to this copy and all it does is randomize the bluetooth address so um, the scan results are not uh, as fast or are not discarded and here we are simply just flipping random bits uh, in the in the payload header and yeah that's it so i um, flash the code on the controller i uh, yeah, set it to discoverable and started scanning with my with my laptop and boom, it crashed actually the controller of my old T uh, T430. And okay, so uh, the problem here is that it's uh, the T430 is a very old laptop. Um, the firmware is from around about 2010. We are not actually that sure because it has no build date in it. Um. We tried the same technique against newer devices, uh, and newer is Nexus 5, so even quite old devices, and they not, uh, seem not to be uh, affected. So I thought, uh, yeah, well, it's probably not worth the effort, but Jiska said, meh, may, maybe uh, you should have a look anyway. So, okay, I looked at it, and yeah, I had no symbols for the firmware, so it was a quite hard time to figure out what's going on at some point uh, i had done i had the full firmware image had an image of the crash and it looks like um that, that it was a heap corruption because we uh, can look from where we come from and as you see um that there are some functions involved that are uh, relevant for the heap and this is quite problematic because um on the on this particular heap implementation if you uh, have a buffer overflow you're basically corrupting some pointer somewhere and then you free the buffer and everything is fine and somewhere later you are trying to access uh, those corrupted data and then it crashes so the it is basically impossible to correlate the crash with the cause of, of the crash um yeah so we had no luck with uh, with this one so we gave up and focused more on the emulation part of the uh, of the our research and yeah, the basic idea here is that you know, well, the firmware is just ARM code, and we can maybe we can just extract a well-defined firmware state that contains all the registers or the memory, um, and just restore the registers and try to re-execute it maybe. And this is here on the right is the code how we did this. So we have this xmit state function that can be also invoked as a hook. Uh, uh, as a hook. And all it does is it saves the rest, uh, registers to the stack and stores the stack pointer at a fixed location in memory. <coughs> and then we are calling the xmit memory function that will actually uh, disable all the interrupts. So we have no um, other code running in the meantime. And then we are sending all the uh, memory regions uh, that we want to the host. And this is important that we no, uh, do not use uh, functions that use threading, for example, invoking the BT transport thread. So we just directly use the hardware registers to uh, send out the, the memory dump. And if we have now the memory dump on the host, we can basically call the continue function. And this will uh, restore, first of all, the stack pointer and load the registers and continue execution. And yeah, we, let's see how, uh, how far we, we can get with it. But first of all, um, yeah, we have the memory dump, and of course we ha don't have the hardware registers anymore. We have no UR, the radio front end isn't implemented, so we have to do some modifications to the um, to the firmware, firmware first of all. And here is how we did this. So we just wanted to use uh, plain QL more ARM, um, so not we didn't want to implement or to uh, mess up with QML. 
And so first of all, we have here the firmware where we extract our memory dumps and those are then converted to, to object files. And as I said, we need to do some modifications. We uh, want to write C code. The C code um, lives in the same memory, um, as the same address space as the firmware. So we also can compile this to, um, to an object file. And as I said before, we have a full list of all functions of all uh, global variables, etc. So what we can do is we can link our C code against the firmware image that is stored in the uh, that we extracted from the chip. So um, we can basically write C code in the same address space. So we can in invoke functions, we can pass data structures and, and so on. And in the end, we are after we have compiled everything, we can link it to a new ELF file. And the ELF file uh, then describes the, the memory layout, of course. Um, of the uh, of the firmware, and down here he has an extra page where our C code lives. And the C code, first of all, does some modifications to the to the ROM and to the RAM, and then second, it calls the continue function and restores those registers. And uh, yeah, first of all, what we did is we added a lot of debug messages so uh, that we can trace function calls um, which are invoked in order to understand what is going on. And in the end, we were able to implement uh, the threading behavior. We were able to inject and extract HCI messages. And we were also able to uh, inject and extract raw wireless frames. So what we can do right now is, um, as we ca can make use of HCI, we can try to attach it to a running operating system and feed basically data to standard in that are then processed by, by the firmware as it were valid uh, wireless frames, and then see how the um, firmware behaves together with the operating system and see what's going on. And this is what I want to quickly show you in, in a demo. I hope it works. So. I have here an Ubuntu, and as you can see here, I have the. I am, let me make. Okay, that's yeah, that's better. Um, I have here the um, Bluetooth settings of Ubuntu open. There is currently no adapter. Uh, here I have the um, BTmon running, so we can see what's going on on the HCI level. And here is a watch on HCI config and. <clears throat> that currently there's no adapter. And here on the top, there is the magic happening. So uh, this HCI attached binary is actually the compiled firmware that we can uh, run and it will automatically attach to the Bluetooth stack. And we now pass, uh, pass random data into the um, compiled firmware and see uh, how the system, uh, system behaves. And as soon as I execute it, we can first of all see that we've get uh, a lot of logs here. Uh, activity going on in the btmon. We have a new, a new adapter here that is now up and running. And sooner or later, um, the firmware uh, actually starts the device inquiry and scans for devices and we get actually valid scan results. So the random data that we are passing to the firmware are interpreted as wireless frames. And if we have a look here in btmon, uh, we can see here event uh, device found, another device found, and yeah, of course, we get also uh, a lot of logs, and I hopefully... Mm. Damn it. <laughs> Demo time uh, doesn't work. But um, anyways... Um, yeah, um, uh, let me start it again. Mm. Scanning for devices. Yeah, no matter. Um, yeah, as we can see, uh, we get a lot of logs. Um, and what I also told you that, uh, that we can re-execute a firmware state. And 
so in this case, we have here uh, also a web front end where you can execute the firmware and get even more insights into it. And um, so here I have a, a compiled firmware state that will just execute the firmware and um, until it enters, enters the idle state. So here we have the debug output. Um, and as you can see, we have here uh, information about the context switches, um, memory allocations, and so on. Uh, we can also uh, get here a, a view of the memory where we can see what um, what memory regions are, are modified and also all the symbols. And on the bottom, uh, we have a um, we have a activity map of the of the memory, and um, where we can see what memory regions are executed, which uh, which are read, which are written, and you can uh, zoom into here, and there are also symbol annotations, and um, for the firmware. So. Um, Yes, sorry that the demo didn't work quite out because what, what actually happened is uh, this year um, because uh, in the de device inquiry there's um, there's actually a bug and uh, so there's a, a heap corruption and the firmware should actually crash at some point with a, a heap corruption detected and this year is uh, um, is what you uh, would see on the console so. Um, yeah, we have added a heap sanitizer to it, and somewhere that received Um And yeah, okay, here is it. Uh, we can see that we here uh, have a memory allocation with hex 109 bytes, and it's uh, returned this address here. And later we are doing a mem copy into uh, this actual buffer with a length that is uh, way longer than the um, 600 and uh, longer than the 109 uh, nine bytes. <coughs> and this is then uh, detected by by the heap sanitizer and gives us information actually where the um, heap overflow happened uh, with all the link registers, so we can actually debug the the, um, uh, the firmware. And this was an uh, actual CVE that we have reported. And it is, heap, as I said, a heap corruption during the device uh, inquiry. And as we had a closer look to it, it was actually the same bug um, as on the T430. So the problem here is <coughs> that we have a, a bug within the firmware um, uh, that we can observe on a firmware from 2010 and on a firmware that is uh, from t uh, 2018. So it was at least for uh, eight to 10 years um, in, in production, um, this bug. And most interesting here is that the bug is actually located in two different uh, locations. One is uh, inside the uh, Bluetooth core scheduler and the other is in the link manager. And if you have a look uh, at the source code, what is happening here, uh, we are first of all extracting the um, the, the packet length from the payload header uh, by discarding the lower three bits and then masking out the length field. And in the link manager thread, we are allocating uh, 264 bytes of memory. And then we are doing a, a mem copy into this buffer with the previously computed length. And what you might ask is here, okay, first of all, a uh, uh, length check is missing. Uh, what happens if we send uh, data that is or a packet that is longer than the expected 240 bytes? And the answer is actually uh, nothing will happening uh, because you, uh, the maximum packet size is limited on the uh, on the physical layer. But what's uh, the, actually the um, the deadly bug here is that the bit mask he over here is uh, is wrong. It's uh, 13 bits, not 10 bits, as it should be. So the packet length also inclu includes the reserve for future uh, use field. And this field is normally normally set to zero. And as soon as you uh, set a single bit into the field to one, um, you greatly exceed the uh, maximum packet size and therefore uh, trigger a buffer overflow. Okay, so um, you might ask, um, I can uh, have a, co a mem copy with um, that causes overflow, but I can't actually control the data that I'm uh, overflowing with. So what's the point here? But uh, in fact, if we have a look, closer look at the firmware, uh, what we did is we uh, set the 
uh, used a pattern for the for the payload data that we could easily recognize in memory. So here on the bottom you can see uh, the blue part is uh, um, is the actual packet that, that we send. And for some reason uh, we don't know even why. Um, the, some part of the packet is actually duplicated in the end. So even though we're only sending 240 bytes of uh, memory, uh, we can get a controlled overflow here. And this is pretty dangerous on the uh, on the SIPL implementation, because if we have a look here, um, this is how the heap looks like. It's basically just a management of, of buffers with a uh, fixed size. So we have here a free list of or a linked list of uh, all the free buffers. And if we have an overflow, we can corrupt one of those uh, pointers and basically redirect the linked list to an arbitrary location memory. So what we can uh, then do is uh, we can uh, treat any arbitrary memory location uh, as a valid buffer if we are able to uh, allocate uh, three buffers in a row. And then, therefore, we can overwrite arbitrary data. And um, as there are no exploit mitigations at all, so the complete memory is writable and executable, um, we have a write what where gadget. Uh, we can basically overwrite a function in RAM and therefore gain code execution. And if you think about ASRR, um, forget about it. It's uh, all static layout. Um, so really no um, exploit mitigations at all. So we built a full proof of concept for this and then um, disclosed it to Broadcom. So on April um, last year, we um, informed them finally. And after two weeks, we uh, requested a status update and asked uh, what's going on. And they said um, that they have found this bug in February 2018 and they had a complete fix and formed all, all their customers and there's a, soft, a software upgrade available and so everything is fine. And uh, this is a pretty strong poker face here because, well, our latest snapshot from the firma was January, January 2018 and they stated that the bug that was for at least eight years within the uh, in the firmware uh, was fixed two weeks later. Uh, so we had a closer look on this because um, I was pretty sure that I have tested uh, the Samsung Galaxy A3 with a um, patch level that was after after February 2018. And later we also um, tested the Samsung Galaxy S8, um, what has a, a patch level from uh, March 2019, what was quite recent at that point in time. And in fact, uh, we tested even more devices and we couldn't find any device that uh, actually was not vulnerable. So even some fitness tracker were vulnerable. And so we asked what's going on and they said, yeah, we no normally provide fixes to our customers and yeah, it's at their discretion if they want to fix a bug or not. So, um, yeah, as I said, we couldn't find any device that uh, was patched um, until Yiska bought the S10e. And here's a, a relevant part of the code. So here's the mem copy again. And uh, they have indeed added a length check. So they are checking here if the length is greater than expected 240 bytes. And if it's the case, they are truncating it. And this firmware has a build date from April uh, 2018. So they indeed found the bug in February. So this is, for, uh, this is legit. But uh, yeah, well. Um, in the end, we had to uh, escalate it to the vendors. Uh, so we contacted um, Go uh, Google and we co contacted Apple because they are using, or at least Apple is using Broadcom Bluetooth chips and the Samsung, uh, also, uh, of course, are using uh, Android as well. And so uh, and Android supplied uh, fixed or firmware images with this fix in August 2019. And also Apple um, provided fixes and gave us public recognition. And yeah, this was um, pretty pretty st uh, stressful disclosure as we had to really um, ask the vendors, uh, please could you supply a fix um, to finally um, for a remote code execution that is in the firmware for over 10 years. Um, that's not the way how it should be. So. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, ACL or asynchronous connectionless. What is the term for Bluetooth connections? 
So fuzzing as, uh, ACL is um, is of course an interesting target because it's the most complex task um, or the most complex yeah, thing in the firmware because uh, this also includes the link manager protocol implementation uh, in the link manager. So we really expected some bugs here, especially because uh, Yiska already found a missing length check in the um, in this handler table. Um, so we tried actually a lot. So we tried coverage guided fuzzing um, with the Bluetooth stack attached. We tried uh, coverage guided fuzzing uh, on ACL packets, but this wasn't um, didn't yield any results because the ACL packets are di directly passed to the BT transport thread and therefore um, they do not uh, they are not processed by the link manager and we also tried the same uh, like for the in inquiry packets where we um, mutated the packets before they are written to the hardware registers and none of those um, approaches yielded any useful bugs so we co were not able to crash the firmware what was quite uh, surprising to us but except um, <clears throat> there was one crash uh, we could observe on the Nexus 5. And this was uh, during my thesis, but the problem here was A, it wasn't in scope because I, I, I wrote my thesis on dynamic uh, firmware analysis and therefore um, the Android operating system was not, was not in scope. Uh, I hadn't really time to debug this. In addition, uh, our build here uh, had no symbols, so what make it even, uh, makes it even worse. And then we are in a heavily threaded process. As you can see here, we are crashing in, in thread number 19. Um, so I gave up on this and stated in, the, in, the, uh, in my thesis that it's probably the fragmentation exploit described by Bluebone. Um, but later we um, actually retested it and throw the same fuzzer against the um, S10e and actually yeah we could um, there also observe a crash um, but we yeah, basically forgot about it and as you can see we have here um, finally also symbols so we are crashing in a mem copy what uh, looks good on the first hand but if you have a look here on x2 what is was uh, during invocation the length parameter of the mem copy it looks pretty much like a negative number and the fault address here with a lot of zeros um, in the end also indicates or is a strong indication that uh, we are having here a mem copy with a negative number what is an infinite mem copy so we are run running at the end of a page and therefore crash and if you have a look at this reassemble and disp dispatch function, um, we can uh, we can see here that there is indeed a mem copy with a difference in the uh, in the length argument. And if you have a um, if you roll the numbers, there's indeed an, an edge case where you can uh, cause a mem copy with a negative length. Um, what is caused by uh, this if statement? What is actually a buffer overflow protection? So, okay, this is a, a valid case, but uh, as we tried further fuzzing, uh, fuzzing and see uh, what crashes we ca could generate, um, there are some crashes that we couldn't really explain. For example, this one, um, where the fault address looks, looks really odd, like um, even it, um, as we have overwritten it with uh, some ASCII, and it's a completely different code location, and all those crashes are um, were not reprodu reproducible and so yeah we might expect there is uh, something uh, else going on but first of all um, the relevant code location here um, is for the um, uh, L2 cup defragmentation so and it works like this if you have a, a packet uh, that or want to send an L2 cup message that is longer than you can uh, send on the physical layer for example you have to uh, frag uh, fragmented in, in some way and um, so if you um, send the packet you say I here's a packet that, or l 2 cup packet that is a thousand byte long and here you have the first 500 or so and then the um, host operating system will then allocate uh, the full 1000 bytes and if and keep the uh, keeps track of the offset where the packet or the current packet ends and then if the next packet arrives it then uh, copies 
the payload in the end of the packet and then tries to reassemble it. And the problem here is that the mem copy on a prior Android 10 is really weird when it comes to negative uh, numbers. We haven't done a full disclosure on this, but um, it was indeed possible to um, to exploit this bug, at least for an Android 10. And here's what, uh, how it looks in the end. So you end up with a basically reverse shell with the same privileges as the Bluetooth um, daemon on, on Android. Um, and as we then wrote our write-up um, to report it to Google, um, we actually had a, a second look um, at the master branch because I um, had um, bookmarked for myself the source code for the Android 9 uh, branch because this is what running on my test device. And then I had a look at the master branch and as you can see here, um, there already was a commit um, that fixes uh, actually fixes this bug and it also says uh, directly wrong packet length, uh, length leading to memory corruption. And this uh, bug, uh, this commit was actually from a April 2018. So it was a quite, um, quite old bug and it was visible for, for a couple of months publicly in the uh, in the master branch, but for some reason it wasn't um, applied to any uh, releases. Um, yeah. So yeah, as as I said before, we uh, built a POC for this. Um, at the point it was fixed, what was in, in February, um, it affected uh, around about 60% of the Android devices, so around about uh, 1.5 billion. And um, yeah, we did this, uh, the disclosure on November, on the 3rd November 2019, and the fix finally came out on February uh, 2020. So uh, even Google requires a full 90 days to, to um, basically ap uh, apply a commit that is already there in the master branch. And we here uh, also have here the problem that there are a lot of devices that only receive quarterly updates, so only receive updates every every 90 days. And there are so, still a lot of devices that will not receive uh, updates at all because um, the phone is older than uh, two years. And then we were also contacted by um, some automotive vendors um, where I'm not even sure how their patch cycle looks like. So um, this is a uh, always the problem if you have a chain of, of different co uh, companies, if you report a bug to the first company, uh, they require 90 days to fix it. And then the next company also need, it, need 90 days to fix it and, and so on. So um, disclosure of such vulnerabilities can, can take a long time. And yeah, finally to my conclusion, um, exploiting is quite exhausting, exhausting. So I would like to see if vendors would directly fix um, memory corruption vulnerabilities uh, without requiring a full uh, remote code execution proof. Uh, like for example, in the Broadcom case, they found the bug uh, previously, but they didn't supply it any patches. Same for, for Android, the bug was known, but uh, no patches were supplied. And we still have the problem with, um, with patch supplies. So there are always unfixable devices. It takes a long time for, for the patch to reach the customers. And yeah, we have finally released our um, our tool that we've used here, what <laughs> didn't work uh, quite a bit, uh, that well in this live demo. But uh, if you are interested, here's a source code. It also uh, describes how we um, exploited the uh, the Broadcom vulnerability in the device inquiry and also some additional information. And that was it from my side, and I would be open for questions. Yep. Jupp, okay. ich höre dich. Sind wir auf dem uh, Stream, Regie? Alles klar. So, um, which heap sanitizer has been used to detect the inquiry bug you mentioned? Um, this was our own heap, uh, heap sanitizer implementation. So they are using the heap implementation from ThreadX. And we uh, basically reverse engineered the, the heap. And it's actually quite easy to run some uh, basic checks if the heap is still intact. And then we set hooks on uh, the most interesting functions that will re um, 
will basically ta test if the uh, heap is still intact and will throw an error message if there is something wrong. Um, I guess um, ASLR is not possible on, on the ARM Cortex M3, I guess they are using. Um, it's ASRR is something that you really can't use on uh, embedded devices. Um, I guess that DEP, so data execution prevention, could um, be possible, but they had to have to write their firmware images, so their updates into uh, into the run, so it has to be executable at some point, and they should uh, lock it afterwards. But I'm not sure if they will implement it. At and at some point, and Broadcom also now has implemented some sort of heap checks. So, <clears throat> and this is, I guess, also why they found the bug yet. Uh, yet, but it's not really an exploit mitigation, we but more a debug. In response to this bug, um. That what? Good. Um, so I, we just counted it. I guess it's run about uh, one or two hundred hooks that we are using. Uh, there are a lot of um, debugging hooks. Um, and the, but the number of functions that are needed to be replaced are actually not that much. Um, most um, important are those functions like writing to an URL register and it's a simple function. It gets a, a pointer to a buffer and a length and it writes those data to you out and you can basically uh, just replace it with a uh, with a write. Uh, same for URL read. Um, and yeah, uh, there are some fu functions that d do not make any sense on uh, in the in the user space, for example, enabling and disabling interrupts. So these are functions that we uh, disabled right away. And let me think. And yeah, there are all those um, uh, like hardware re relevant functions that will, for example, do a read on a hardware register and write on a hardware register. And if, as long as I can write uh, to a valid memory location, it's probably uh, fine. And if you have this memory state, um, you also have pretty good default values. So it turned out to work okay-ish. Um, for which one? Also for the Broadcom exploit, it's uh, in the GitHub repo. Um, so simo-lab slash Frankenstein. Uh, the Android proof of concept is not released yet. 